for this event and you're very welcome and I'm very pleased to be able to share this time with everyone. The question of how we choose to shape human behaviour to generate the sorts of outcomes we want to see is an incredibly profound one so I'm very pleased to be here today. So a few house rules if just people could be aware that we're being recorded and also the event is being live streamed and people can ask questions in the chat at any time and then we'll wait till Felicity's presented her material and then I'll take the in the chat in the Q&A and inviting people to ask their question directly. So let me just hand over to Fiona Devine to give you a welcome. Hi, thank you very much, Liz. Um, so delighted to see so many of you joining us today to hear from my colleague in Alliance Manchester Business School and a Professor of Practice, Felicity Allgate. So as many of you will know in this series, we hear from new and newly promoted professors in the Business School who are delivering their inaugural lectures. Felicity joined us in June 2020 in a part-time capacity while continuing her work as director at the Behavioural Insights team. So this web webinar is an opportunity for us in the business school to welcome her, even though it's been a little while since she was here, um, but really glad um, that we have the opportunity to do so today. So great to see so many colleagues online supporting Felicity and of course, Thank you to the audience to join us from right across the globe. There are opportunities, as we heard, through Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us wherever you, whichever platform you're using. So in her role in AMBS, Felicity teaches across the portfolio programs is, and is undertaking research on the application of behavioral science to public policy. Felicity is also working with the ESRC funded Productivity Institute, which is headquartered in the business school, where she used her experience of policymaking and experimentation to identify opportunities for projects which answer interesting research and policy questions in this area. Felicity began her career as a currency strategist and an economist in a large investment bank back in 2005. She currently leads, as we heard, Behavioural Insights Team North, which she founded in 2016. BIT works in partnership with governments, local authorities, businesses and charities to tackle major policy problems. And Felicity collaborates with partners across the UK to use behavioural insights to improve health, tax collection, recycling, economic growth, early years education and employment support. So during her time there, so, so far, of course, she's still there, Felicity has designed and run more than 30 randomized controlled trials. And this includes co-designing the 30 million pound study to evaluate the impact of the growth vouchers program. And that is the largest randomized control trial in the world by value, so quite something. Now in today's lecture, Felicity will talk about the evolution of behavioral insights from a phrase coined by a small government team in, back in 2010 to a policy approach which touches the lives of millions of people around the world. She will also discuss her current areas of focus and where behavioral insights might be used in the next 10 years and beyond. So there's going to be plenty of time towards the end of the session for your questions. Do please type them into the chat function in the, at the bottom of your screen as we go along. You don't have to hold back. And today the discussion and questions are going to be facilitated by Liz, Liz Richardson, who is a professor of public administration here at, at the University of Manchester. Uh, and Liz and I knew each other a very long time ago. She is a professor in politics in the School of Social Science, where, of which I was previously the head. So very nice to, to have Liz uh, facilitating this event as well. Liz's research interests include participatory approaches to policymaking and decentralized forms of government governance. And her co-authored book, Nudge Nudge Think Think, experimenting with ways to change citizen behavior is now in its second edition with Manchester University Press, so really doing well. 
So without further ado, I'm sure you're all keen to get started. Let me hand over now to Professor Felicity Allgate. So thank you, Felicity. Thank you, um, and thank you for that introduction. I'm just going to share my slides. This is always a slightly awkward bit when you hope that it works. Um, hopefully you can all see those. Let's put it into presentation mode. There we go. Um, so I can't see anybody waving at me. Perfect. So yeah, they're great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, as Fiona said, um, my name is Felicity. I work jointly at the Business School and at the Behavioural Insights team. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about how behavioural insights has transformed public policy and then also what I think particularly interesting topic, what comes next. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to give you a little bit of context and background to explain sort of where, where the um, behavioural insights team came from. So if you cast your mind back to 2007, 2008, there was an enormous financial crisis. Um, I was actually working at an investment bank at the time, so it was quite an eventful sort of few months. Um, and that um, just brought to the end a, a cycle of kind of economic growth, and particularly in the UK, shifted government policy from one that was about sort of spending to actually a mindset that was much more about sort of austerity and, and um, saving on government spending. Um, that same year, a book called Nudge was published. Now, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with it. Um, if you haven't read it, the Nudge, the final edition, was published um, either this year or last year. And I would highly recommend it as a really excellent book that's well written and very thoughtful. Um, and in Nudge, the two authors, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, set out um, what they call libertarian paternalism. And it's this idea of creating choice architecture so the way um, choices are framed and how you can use that to, as the title says, improve decisions about health, wealth and happiness. So this book was published. Um, it was sort of reasonably popular at the time. But one of the crucial points for my story today is that it was included on the Conservative Party's summer reading list. So it was something that had been picked up by the Conservative Party. Um, jump forward a couple more years. In March 2010, the Institute for Government published a report called Mindspace. Um, which pulled together um, a survey of the evidence about ways to influence behaviour. Um, that was commissioned by, um, he was Sir Gus O'Donnell at the time, who was then the Cabinet Secretary, who's the head of the civil service. So I think there's two points to make there, one of which is Nudge had been picked up by the Conservative Party and politicians more generally, but actually already the civil service were thinking about using behavioural science um, as a way of trying to influence behaviour. And then finally on this slide, in May 2010, the first coalition government since the Second World War was elected in the UK. Um, for those of you who aren't particularly familiar with UK politics, it's extremely unusual to have coalition government in the UK. So this was an unusual circumstance. And one of the things that happened in order to form that government is um, the drawing up of what's called a coalition, the coalition agreement. Um, and there was a phrase within that which founded the Behavioural Insights team. So the phrase in question, um, it has a whole, a whole spiel around it, but is that our government will find intelligent ways to encourage, support and enable people to make better choices for themselves. So that really set the mandate for the um, team at the time, and it was about supporting people making choices. So this was moving away from what was seen as sort of the previous Labour government and Liz's, maybe we'll talk about this a bit later, which was a bit more kind of paternalistic, kind of about the state trying to fix things and moving into a deregulatory approach, um, which was also at the same time um, about austerity as well. So cutting back significantly on a variety of um, uh, government spending. So it was about a sort of pulling back generally of the state in, state in the UK. So within um, that, that's a sort of useful bit of history, probably less interesting for what I'm gonna be talking about today. But the point of this slide is to just give you a quick oversight and really I hope to demonstrate how quickly and expansive and large expansion there has been of behavioral insights, both the team. So in 2010, we were formed inside number 10. So that's a very small photo of me and some of my colleagues um, in the first couple of years of operation. Um, and now if you jump forward to 2022, we are a global organization with offices in um, five countries, I think it is, or it might be six, I can't quite remember. Um, we have more than 250 employees worldwide. We've done um, more than a thousand projects, actually. It says 750, but depending on how you count them. That includes more than 400 randomized control trials. 
Um, and crucially, that's just the behavioral insights team, but this has also spread globally. So the OECD has identified more than 100 projects in 41 different countries using elements of behavioral science. Um, and every UK central government department has a behavioral insights team. They vary in size, but all of them have at least one behavioral scientist sort of lurking around somewhere in Whitehall. Um, lots of local government has behavioral insights team. The local government association has devoted quite a lot of funding to helping spread and advocate for this approach generally. So in terms of sort of what you might think of as bums on seats or something, this is, this is a successful approach. It has expanded significantly. Many, many hundreds of people are now working on it globally um, and applying it in a public policy setting. So that's the kind of context and the expansion. And I suppose I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about what I mean by behavioral insights. So as Fiona said at the beginning, it is a term that was um, coined by the team itself. Um, I joined the team in 2011, so about a year after it had been first been established. Um, and at that point, we were really starting to find our feet and sort of work out exactly what it is we were trying to do. And the term behavioral insights, I mean, I don't think there is a clear definition, but we've sort of codified it as being having three components. So the first of which is about evidence about behavior. Um, and that draws heavily from academic research, um, particularly research in psychology, behavioral economics, behavioral finance, even the fact that I'm using so many terms, I think is a great illustration of how multidisciplinary this is, approach is. And while in the behavioral insights team, we are interested in theory in that we want to, we don't just sort of randomly apply things. We do think about what makes something work in what situation. We're much less interested in necessarily developing a new theory and more interested in, in the in sort of empirical application and, and what do we know has been empirically shown to change behavior. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is about a practical application and a pragmatic focus. And again, this is something I've really noticed um, since joining the business school. Um, when I joined the business school, I'd sort of thought, oh yes, actually we're a very, very kind of rigorous research-based organization the behavioral insights team and I still do think we are but we are answering research questions within kind of time and budget constraints in order to help whoever our partner is and um, the client answer a particular question so for us it is unacceptable to conclude from a piece of work that more research is needed um, we will heavily caveat findings if necessary but it's all about taking what we've we've done and sort of making a recommendation based on that so that's where this practical application and pragmatic focus is. And that can mean that in some situations or a particular project, we might combine a number of what you'd call sort of behavioral biases or approaches to try and have the biggest impact on changing behavior that we can, because we are more interested in, for example, maximizing the uptake of vaccines than we are necessarily identifying exactly what the psychological mechanism at play is. And there's a role for everything, but this is specific to um, the behavioral insights team. And then the third point is about robust evaluation. Um, and I've already said that as an organization, we've done um, more than 400 randomized control trials. And this is again, where I think there has been a genuine revolution in, in government policy. So RCTs were very, very uncommon. I mean, they're not super common now, <laughs> but they are becoming a more established way of thinking about evaluation in government policy. And one of the things I think it really has moved beyond is not necessarily just analysts or kind of um, economists sort of sitting in a government department or a local, local um, authority sort of thinking, well, how we might we evaluate this? But now programmes in some cases have it systematically built into the design of the programme to include evaluation. Um, and one of the reasons I think why we're so interested in this robust evaluation, I think there's two reasons, one of which is um, context matters a lot. So whether behavior can or can't be changed and the evidence where it's worked before, you know, if you apply that in a new setting, it doesn't always hold. Um, and then the, last, the second point is that when the team was set up, quite unusually for a government department, we had what's called a sunset clause. So we were given two years to prove that we were able to deliver a 10 to one return on the cost of the team. Now that's quite difficult to do in many cases because you can sort of talk about the number of policies you've changed, but you know, how do you prove that? So what is what is sometimes called the counterfactual? What would have happened if you hadn't done anything? 
And that's where, for those of you who are familiar with randomized control trials, they offer, you know, when well designed, they are sort of the gold standard of evaluation. And they help you very clearly identify exactly what the impact of your intervention is. So that was partly why we started off thinking about those and then it's, it's um, had a huge influence on our, our approach. Um, I suppose the, the final point about why we aren't the behavioural science team, you'll notice that I've referred to us as the BIT, so the behavioural insights team. Um, everything gets shortened and we really didn't want to be the BS team. So that's where um, this term behavioural insights came about was because there was unfortunate acronym possibilities with the alternatives. Um, so as well as hopefully convincing you that it has uh, uh, revolutionised public policy just through the sheer range of application, I'm going to give a few examples now about, um, these are UK specific examples, what are called unicorn policies. Um, and this, the name, I actually don't know where the term comes from, but it's um, policies that have generated more than a billion pounds in savings. And I'm going to briefly discuss five, um, which BIT has been involved in to a greater or lesser extent. So we've had some involvement in all of them. Some we were instrumental in, and then others was more, we sort of worked with other people. The first, which is UK pensions. So as I'm sure many of you know, um, in the UK, the default option, if you are employed and you work, uh, you earn over a certain amount, and I think it's if you work for three months, then you are automatically enrolled into a pension. Now, before 2012, when you joined, when you were first employed, so this happened to me when I got my first job, I got this huge pack about pensions that I had to sign some form and send it back and all that sort of stuff. And actually, lots of people never got round to doing that for a whole variety of reasons, even though there was lots and lots of evidence showing that lots of people, you know, they wanted to save for their pension, but for a variety of reasons, they weren't getting around to doing it. So by switching the default um, in since 2012, we've now got more than an additional 10 million more people saving for their pension, which is about the equivalent of 20 million pounds a year additional saving. Um, and this is this idea that actually by switching the default, people can still opt out. You're not forcing them to have a pension because some people can't afford it or maybe they don't want to for a whole variety of other reasons. So you're not removing their choice, which is a key tenant of the nudge work sort of set out by Thaler and Sunstein, but it, it just makes it easy for people to get their pension. Um, and as I said, I've said already, it's led to millions more people saving for their pension. Now, has it fixed the problem entirely? No, because the default enrollment rate is that people make a default contribution of 8%. That's probably not enough for most people to have an adequate um, pension fund for retirement. So there's still more to do, but I still think it's an excellent example of how these things can work well. The second approach is energy markets. Um, and here, as um, energy prices are in the news a lot at the moment, but it's also a heavily regulated market. But it's one that um, I can't remember how long ago now, but, you know, a few decades ago, they privatized energy providers. And the idea being that if you have um, a well-functioning market, you'll have demand and supply and consumers will be able to shop around and they'll find a good deal. And then that will help um, encourage efficiency throughout the market and lead to better prices and better choice. Now, it doesn't seem to have worked in energy markets because about I think it's about half of people are still being supplied by the supplier when the, the, the market was privatized. So they've never switched. Now, until, I mean, it's probably not the case anymore, but probably until about six months ago, if you were someone who switched around a lot with your energy provider, you could get a great deal. And in some cases, you may end up paying almost less than the cost price. But that's because there was this huge group of people who weren't really doing anything and they were just charging. They were being charged very high prices. So we've done work as the Behavioural Insights team um, and also Ofgem, the energy regulator, have done lots of work about prompting people to switch, so encouraging them to shop around more. So again, this is not forcing people to change supplier, um, but by sort of things like sending letters, sending various a variety of different bits of information. And the estimate is that since 2008, about £2 billion has been saved just by people switching. The third example is e-cigarettes. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. Um, and the idea being here, the sort of behavioural insight is, in an ideal world, people who smoke would stop smoking entirely, but it's very, very difficult to do for a whole variety of reasons. So lots of people, I can't remember exactly what the stat is, but I think people take an average of five attempts before they quit. So it's a hard thing to do. And 
In many cases, it's easier to do a sort of closer substitute of behavior than it is to change your habits significantly. So here, smoking an e-cigarette instead of a, a traditional cigarette is an easier substitute than just stopping smoking entirely. And um, the estimates, again, are that approximately 40,000 people, additional extra um, smokers quit every year. Um, and the quality, so this, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is the quality adjusted life year, which is a sort of standard calculation for trying to put a monetary value on health um, improvements, is about a billion pounds. Now, is smoking e-cigarettes as good for you as not smoking at all? No. But the overall health impact, I would say, is, you know, this is about the pragmatic focus about making things better. Um, the fourth example is tax trials. And here, this was some of our first ever randomized control trials were on tax. Um, and by changing the letter to include the, the line, nine out of 10 people pay their tax on time, brought forward about an extra 200 million pounds in the first two years. Um, and HMRC or one of the government departments, which have really adopted behavioral insights in an amazing way. Um, I mean, I would imagine almost all of us on this call have probably been part of a tax trial in one way or the other, because they have a big team and they systematically run trials on all kinds of tax collection policy. And I think it's worth saying, we didn't necessarily think tax was necessarily the most thrilling public policy option. But again, this is this pragmatic focus of HMRC send about a billion letters a year. So if you can change the behavior to a small extent of a lot of people, then you only need, you need a lot of people to do something slightly different and you have a very large cumulative impact. And then the final example, um, I think is a good example of where actually we, as the Behavioral Insights team, have influenced government policy probably less in a way that we people might expect us to have done. So this is the sugar levy. So in April 2018, um, sometimes known as a sugar tax, so um, fizzy drinks with sugar above a certain amount, there was a tax imposed on them. And the reason we were so supportive of this as a policy and, you know, worked hard with government to sort of set out what we thought was the evidence on why this was an effective policy from a behavioural standpoint is not necessarily so much the influence on consumer behaviour, actually. It does make a difference if you change prices. I mean, this is not, you know, earth shattering psychology. This is kind of basic economics 101. If you change the price of things, people will buy more or less of it, depending on what you do. But here, what we really thought was the thing that the kind of traditional policymakers had missed was thinking about the reformulation of products by the manufacturers in order to sort of avoid being seen as being unhealthy. Um, and since April 2018, when the sugar levy was introduced, um, half of manufacturers have reformulated their drinks um, and about 45 million kilograms of sugar have been removed from the fizzy drink kind of market. Um, and again, the quality impacts of this quality of adjusted life year, I've forgotten what quality stands for, um, is about 3.3 billion. Um, so those are just a few examples. I mean, we don't have loads more of uh, unicorn um, policies sort of tucked in our back pocket, but I don't think it's bad for, you know, in the space of 10 years, a team of on average about 100 people actually has helped deliver all those savings. So just to move on, I think, to think about some of the questions and some of the um, maybe critiques that have been made or, or criticisms, actually, critique makes it sound terribly friendly, but criticism um, of behavioural science as an approach. So the first of which, and this is thinking particularly, I think, from a um, should government be doing this? So is it ethical to nudge people? So I know this is something Liz has thought a lot about and um, with colleagues of hers about is it some sort of covert thing and actually do nudges work? Are you tricking people? All that sort of stuff. And maybe we'll talk a little bit more about it in the discussion. But I think I'd make two points. One of which is, and this is thinking particularly from a public policy standpoint, um, at the very least, government needs to know what it is because private organizations do this all the time. Um, so they seek to influence consumer behavior in a whole range of ways, often to make people buy things. Um, it can be for both good and for bad. And again, we'll talk about that a bit more in a few minutes. But at the very least, government should know what this stuff is. Um, and I would actually argue on my second point that the reality is that we can't avoid doing it. So what we know is that the way you frame choices, the way you provide people with information, the way you design services and products influences 
whether people like how people respond and how they behave as a result. So pensions, as I've already talked about, is a good example. So we know that most people suffer with what's called um, inertia. So the idea that you just sort of don't really do anything. <laughs> and this is not only in sort of slightly mundane things. This is in huge decisions about, you know, which university you go to. Do you save for a pension? It's not just boring stuff like, I don't know, which toilet paper do I buy? Um, and we also know, so we know that, you know, there isn't really a neutral option. So government needs to do something some way. So I would argue that actually we should be incorporating good quality evidence in order to frame that in the way that coincides with what people want to do but for wider society benefit. Now, we could have a two-hour discussion on exactly when and when they aren't appropriate in terms of nudges and government policy and all that sort of stuff. But at a broad level, um, I think we sort of need to do it in order to help um, make taxpayer money be spent as efficiently as possible. Again, it's one of my arguments. And then the second way, um, criticism that's often levelled at both the work of Behavioural Insights team, but also of behavioural science more generally, is does it work? And I think there are often sort of three main points to this. So the first is overclaiming of impact. So there are lots of criticisms about nudging isn't enough. Um, no, <laughs> I don't think the Behavioural Insights team ever claimed it was enough. Um, there are also um, overclaiming of impact. And I think this is more of an academic criticism, actually, um, about there's been lots of um, discussion about sort of um, the size of impact in terms of published articles and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think my summary would be that it does work but it doesn't remove the need for all other government policy leaders. So you couldn't just nudge, um, you will need to do other things as well. And as I hope the examples I used on the previous slide have shown that actually much of the work we've done is not just nudging in terms of changing letters, it's actually about this fundamentally sort of changing the market incentives that exist. Um, the second point on replication, uh, sorry, and does it work is the replication crisis, which again, for those of you who have more of an interest in the sort of academic world, will be very aware that there has been a huge problem in psychology in particular, but also in economics and other disciplines in terms of work that had been published, sort of purporting to show a huge impact on influencing behavior, subsequently either can't be replicated. Um, so is it that the impact didn't hold? In some cases, it appears that that's due to sort of dishonesty or bad practice. Um, and then in other cases, it might be a question of sort of the the uh, analytical methods that were used and were they appropriate or not. Um, and then the final, I think, criticism or about does it work is this thing of, can you really say that some of these things are sort of universal influences of behavior? So again, another criticism, which is more of an academic one, but I think is a very, very valid one, particularly in a public policy setting, is the criticism that some of the um, populations that have been used for this research are what's called weird. So um, westernized, educated, industrialized, rich, and then I can then remember what the D stands for. But basically it tends to be sort of US college students who are participating in these um, trials. And are they really representative of people in all different contexts in all different um, places? And again, I think the answer probably is Yes, that is a valid criticism. Um, the work of the Behavioural Insights team and also actually globally with lots and lots of other organisations is starting to apply this in different contexts with different situations. So the Behavioural Insights team has done um, work in Latin America. We've done work in Indonesia. We're starting to do work in sub-Saharan Africa as well. We've done some work in refugee camps. Um, that obviously they're very, very different populations from, say, you know, a load of North American college students. Now, in some cases, our trials have worked. In some cases, they haven't. But I think it is, and this goes back to my point about why we have this sort of third pillar of robust evaluation, is because I, you, I think I would sum up behavioral science as it tells you lots of things about lots of behavior, but it also one of the overriding things is that context matters. Um, so how we operate as individuals will be influenced by the context. And obviously, you can't say that just because I can be influenced in one way means that everybody else can also be. So those are the things. And again, I'm happy to talk about that um, a bit later. And then briefly, just to move on to what next. So what do I think the next 10 years might hold? So more nudging. 
Um, so nudges, I think sometimes, as I said, people sort of think, oh, they're a bit small and they don't really have any impact. Um, there was a um, meta-analysis published uh, about a year ago now by um, a couple of economists um, in the US, which looked at the impact of um, BIT's work, particularly in a North American context, and kind of compared it to academic um, publications. And it found a real world impact of, I think, about 1%. So these nudges do make a difference. And I mean, 1% doesn't necessarily sound particularly impressive. Um, but the point of nudges in particular is that they're often low cost, um, they're easy to implement, and they're quick. So if you think about it, if there are, for example, 10 government departments in the UK, um, I actually don't know how many there are, but let's say there's 10, um, and each of those has 200 policies, and within each of those policies, you could do five nudges. So maybe there's a letter you could change, maybe you could change a website, maybe you could change something. Then that, without really even blinking an eye, is 10,000 nudges you could apply. Um, if you can make a small improvement to half of those, then actually that's a huge influence, like overall cumulative impact in terms of making things work better. So I would hope that nudging continues. Less sludge. So sludge is the opposite of nudge. <laughs> So it's sort of things like, and we can all think of examples um, where it's systems that are designed to make things harder. So um, the example I often think about is Amazon Prime. It's exceptionally easy to sign up for Amazon Prime. Um, it is exceptionally hard to cancel Amazon Prime. And I would say that that is, they have systematically designed that to stop you, you know, to try and prevent you from cancelling your Prime membership. So sludge, I think, I think that is a good example of where that is by design. Now, I also think there's a huge amount of sludge that is sort of by accident, where policies or approaches are just badly designed and it makes it hard for people to navigate. Um, and I think what could be really interesting is actually thinking about those differential impacts. So are there certain groups who are particularly affected by sludge for a variety of reasons? Um, then new areas of public policy. So um, the Behavioural Insights team and I have worked on lots and lots of different areas of public policy. Um, I think there are still lots of areas where it is less commonly used. So I would argue things like health, it's actually a fairly well-established approach. There's still lots to do. Um, but things like economic productivity, sorry, economic policy, productivity, digital markets, all that sort of stuff. These are all areas where we're really only starting to think about it. And I think particularly... From my perspective, what I'm interested in is the application of it to sort of firm behavior. So again, I think there's lots of economic theory, which is all, I mean, theories are great because they help you think about things in a systematic way, but sort of that are still relatively standard in their assumptions about um, how firms behave, will they be profit maximizing, or even if it's not profit maximization, they're sort of operating in a, in quotes, rational manner. Um, and I think it's, it's a really exciting for me personally area of of policy to think about, well, does that, does that really hold? What can we start to say in a more systematic way? Um, the fourth one up on here is what's called upstream interventions. So this is this idea of, you can kind of intervene, you know, by maybe on individuals, by changing their behavior individually, but really, can you get some bigger wins by intervening sort of higher up in this, you might think of it as a supply chain, but this idea. So I think pensions, again, to just use that example as an illustration, you could have written to every single person who was, you know, hadn't signed up for a pension and sort of prompted them to do it. But by switching the default, you just have a much bigger impact by making um, a, a change sort of further upstream. And then the final point is that I do think that in 10 years, we'll probably not be talking about behavioral insights. as like this sort of crazy little thing or maybe slightly separate, but actually it will be incorporated into kind of a standard public policy approach. So the examples I've given on some of the unicorn policies, really that's not separate from the traditional public, like government levers of taxation, information, you know, penalties. It's about changing the way you impl um, implement them and design them in order to sort of have a different impact on, on behavior. So I, I think that over time, and I remember, I read an article, I can't remember if it was by recently about how within economics, behavioral economics will just become part of kind of standard economics as it just gets recognized that it's sort of almost the updating of the theory and the approach. Um, and that is everything I was going to talk about. So I shall stop sharing my screen. I can see we've got quite a few questions already. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what. 
Excellent. So you're right. We have loads of excellent questions already. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first invite Joel Warburton. Uh, if Joel's around and feels uh, uh, who wants to ask your question, if you could unmute yourself and ask your question. And then I'm going to go to Mawson Sapani, and then I'm going to come to John Pantel, because, John, I think your question's a bit hard, so I wanted to start Felicity with an easier one. Joel Warburton, if you're there, uh, please speak. Uh, yeah, hi, Liz, and, uh, and thanks, Felicity. Um, that was really interesting on a really interesting subject. And, uh, yeah, I'll hopefully start with a, a simple one. Um, I was wondering if you could give us examples where some kind of policy or intervention designed by uh, the behavioural insights teams led to some unintended behaviour or an unintended consequence, good or bad? Um, I'm trying to think of some things. So there was a trial I worked on a few years ago um, where we were trying to collect more um, social care payments on time. So um, as you may know, many people um, have to pay at least a contribution towards their social care costs. Um, and there's, in some cases, lots of people do pay on time, but there are people who miss payments fairly regularly. Um, but the, the council we were working with were keen to try and sort of bring revenue forward. And um, what we used was an approach which had been um, uh, used elsewhere. So we used this social norm of nine out of 10 people which is true. So that's, I suppose, one thing to say is it was true that nine out of 10 people did pay their social care bill on time. What we did was put it on the initial request for money. And actually we had quite a few complaints saying, well, I always pay. Um, and I think really the lesson there was that in that context, it wasn't appropriate. It should have been only ever on a reminder letter because they're the sort of backlash where people were like, but I am paying, like, why, why are you making me feel as though I'm not paying? I think it A, illustrates how, how the approach works, but it is also a good example of where actually in hindsight, we didn't apply it in the most appropriate way. Excellent. Okay, so, so that was kind of like a, a side effect, but in, for, the, for the objective that you were, you were going for, did it increase payments? We actually had to um, take the, the wording out of the letter so we weren't able to run the trial because right. we changed it. So we don't know in that case. Right. Um, I think there are, I'm just trying to think of some examples. There are definitely trials where, so we did one on organ donation, for example, where we changed the DBLA website to sort of prompt people to um, sign up the organ donor register. And we tried, I think it was nine variations and one of them, I now can't remember which one, because that's a yeah. good question, did actually reduce the sign-up rate compared to the control. Um, that is available if you want to look it up, but I can't at the moment remember which one was, was unsuccessful. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Excellent. I'm going to move to Mawson Sapani. Mawson, if you're there and you'd like to ask your question, please speak now. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent talk, Felicity. I'm uh, actually a liver physician based in Mortingham. And a quite keen interest in behavior sciences, including my work uh, related to behavior intervention in alcohol-related liver disease and alcoholism. So quite interesting work uh, in influencing the government policy. But what I wanted to know, where does public stand in there? And at what level do you do consultation with public to decide your priorities? You mean to work out whether it's acceptable to use this approach? And also uh, what to nudge on where the priorities are, yeah. the priorities set by government, or is, it, is there broad consultation on uh, what to nudge, who to nudge, when to nudge? Is, yeah. that, is that roughly right, Wilson? Yeah, that's quite right. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's, again, a really good question. So um, we now operate on a, a consultancy basis. So we will put in bids for pieces of work that are commissioned often by government. Um, and that will often specify, for example, we would like to use behavioural insights approach to achieve this policy aim or this outcome. Um, in terms of the sort of consultation on whether that is acceptable, within all our projects, one of the first stages is looking at sort of what's going on, what the context is to make sure that we have an understanding. Um, and in some cases, it's something that is probably relatively uncontroversial, but there are definitely some situations, whether that's the policy area 
or um, the people who we might be trying to sort of influence their behavior, whether you need to be much more kind of careful and nuanced with that. Um, and we will very frequently include an element of um, sort of qualitative research or, or talking to people to try and understand like what is it that's currently sort of affecting them. So why is it the way they behave in the way they do? And that's not necessarily asking people, but just sort of to understand kind of the context that is going on. Um, and then thinking about, okay, well, how do we, how do we try and influence their behavior um, in a way that's most likely to work? And I think actually there's some, been some really excellent discussion of this um, in light of sort of trying to influence behavior in COVID. So about what is or isn't an appropriate mechanism to try and to try and influence people. And I think to answer your question sort of in summary, we don't do, for example, like a big public consultation where we say, what should we nudge on this year? Because that's just not the way in which we operate. We do have principles of as far as possible being open with the work we've done. So if any of you um, have ever looked on our blog, we publish a huge amount about the types of work we do. Um, and then I suppose also, if we are bidding for work that has been commissioned by government, we sort of take a view that this is a democratically elected government, um, and actually they will be kind of commissioning and developing policy, you know, based on that, that democratic mandate. Excellent. Um, I'm going to uh, come circle back to John and the army, but just I wanted to pick up uh, Manoj, question, uh, question in the chat first, because it links to what you've just said, Felicity, which is um, partly you, you said trying to understand why people do the things that they do. So that, that question, I'm going to actually read it out on that person's behalf just to get onto the next batch, uh, was if behaviour is a consequence of something and the, the nudge tackles the consequence or the symptom, what else are you doing to tackle the causes of these behaviours? Um, I'm going to try and answer, I think, in a way. So is it, I think what the question is asking is, are people sort of operating in a certain way? And actually, there's a whole host of reasons that are sort of causing that behavior. So you might be able to fix the behavior, but you're not sort of solving the, the problem or, or the, the, the root cause. Um, and I think that's a really, a really great question. And actually, it's one of the things that through our work providing like broader government policy advice, we would think about influencing that way. Um, the reality is I think in a sort of practical applied organization like we are, often we are doing the work which we are commissioned to do. So um, we will try and address that, but in any report or sort of final presentation, we'd say, okay, well, this is the behavior, but actually you need to think about these wider contextual factors, which might be sort of causing that behavior. And even if we haven't sought to try and correct it, sort of pointing out, actually, this isn't all unconnected. There may be sort of factors which are influencing it. Excellent, thank you. Uh, what I'm gonna do is do, yes, I'm gonna do John Pantal and Naomi Chambers. Uh, if you could ask your questions in turn, then Felicity you could take both questions and these are about health. And then just to let people know where I am, we've got about 10 minutes, I think, left. So after John and Naomi, I'm going to go to Siddharth and Kerry and John Preston. But let's do John Pantel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Liz. No, I think uh, it's like a smorgasbord, Felicity. So many goodies. And in fact, I would just make one comment before I ask my question on the point just raised, because this, this question arises when with smoking cessation and alternatives. I was chair of Stockport Health and Wellbeing Board, and our by ward, our adult smoking, male adult smoking levels ranged from under 10% to 35%. And, and so we have this problem, I think, of, as Liz has pointed out, of understanding the context why are those differences and one size doesn't fit all but uh, i'm a public governor of our local nhs foundation trust and we are preparing for the major changes in nhs commissioning with the disappearance of the clinical commissioning groups and the 
setting up of the uh, uh, in ICS uh, integrated care systems. The government had just delayed by three months the implementation. But there's a group now which is meant to get at the public and community and other interests of what's being required in terms of the benefits from the new commissioning system. And this means that we've got a range of interests from government, elected officials uh, in Greater Manchester, um, professional organisations, through to the individual consumer. The word co-production is being used again. But how do we, in terms of, you know, of having an approach to this mass of different stakeholders, and we're doing a mapping exercise at the moment, how do we actually uh, change the behaviour so that we get some agreement rather than disagreement? Or, you know, some of the public will say, well, it's all really just a trick. You know, this is not, you know, consultation doesn't mean anything. So it's we've got this practical problem of dealing with a whole range of interests and uh, you know rather than the perhaps simple but difficult other examples you mentioned in health thank you very much felicity i told you that was a, a complex one you might need to pop down to stockport to uh, do some um, naomi could i ask you before felicity answers that excellent question naomi could i bring you in to ask your question and then felicity might it might go together it might not yeah Thank you very much. Yes, um, I think it does really. Um, it's linked because you mentioned that um, uh, health has taken on board uh, behavioural insight. And I, but I think it's more in terms of public health, uh, particularly in relation to um, uh, encouraging uh, behaviour change with patients and public and citizens to make healthier choices. I think it's uh, less obvious, and I've just Googled it and can't find it. Uh, I don't think there's a behavioural insights team uh, at the uh, NHS uh, England and Improvement, which runs uh, the NHS operationally on a day-to-day -day basis. And given the fact that we've got such huge strain on the NHS at the moment with huge demand, uh, particularly for urgent and emergency care in primary care and also in our hospitals and ambulance services. I think there's a big prize here around thinking about how um, we might encourage the public to uh, use the NHS differently and actually to their benefit as well as to the benefit of the NHS. Thank you very much. Felicity, yes, so, so out. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to solve all these problems in the next three minutes, but um, on your point, Naomi, of uh, use of the NHS, actually, that is something that BIT has done work on. Um, so we did some work trying to encourage people to not go to accident and emergency for sort of reasons where they could have gone to a local walk-in centre or to their GP. Um, and we were particularly focused on parents who took children with a fever to a and &E. Um, and actually, this is an example of where we tried, so based on um, the uh, letters, sorry, based on admissions information, I'm really sorry, I've got a, a go away, sorry, <laughs> I've got a four-year-old. <laughs> I wonder if she uses nudge on the four-year-old, we'll have to find out later on. Sorry, um, <laughs> lost my flow. Uh, yes, sorry. So what we did is we sent letters. I didn't do the project. It was some of my colleagues where, um, where parents had taken their children. We sent them a letter just sort of saying, these are some alternatives you could consider. Actually, in that case, it didn't subsequently reduce hospital attendance. But I think it is illustrative of this can be used. Um, maybe it just hasn't been as widely. I also think there is potential, huge potential to actually influence um, whether you call them clinicians, but the sort of people who work in the NHS. And again, this is something where there have been some projects. So I did a project about getting more um, cancer referrals sort of um, done through what's called the two week wait. But there's also been work by other people in terms of things like how do you just reduce wastage in hospitals? So by putting prices on you know, the, the rooms where they go and get all the stuff from, that can help reduce wastage. Um, to John's question um, about the sort of range of interests and how you deal with them, <laughs> I don't have a neat answer. It's really hard. 
Um, yeah, I suppose the thing is, I think there's something interesting about, and this again, I don't know, Liz, if you've got any opinion, but actually how you get people to sort of engage and participate in a meaningful way, which I think is often very, very hard to do. And particularly if you are from a community or a group that feels in some way excluded, how do you sort of build up that trust and take account of that? And in particular, I would imagine it's sort of exacerbated when the people doing the doing, whether that's the policy making or the engagement or whatever, are very different from the people who they're actually trying to talk to. And I know there's a lot of discussion about how um, you shouldn't call, because sometimes you will hear the term hard to reach groups. And actually lots of people, I think quite rightly, sort of really object to that and say, no, actually, our services are just not fit for purpose because they're not, like, if they're targeted at these people, why are these people now hard to reach? Like, why are our services not appropriate? But I don't know, Liz, if you've got anything to add to that. Ooh, oh, we've got five minutes, and I want to talk about Nudge Plus, but yeah. we can't. But I would say part of the answer here is the next iteration, the next phase, the evolution of Nudge into Nudge Plus, and we can follow up on this and provide links with materials to this idea for people afterwards. But I'm going to move on to, oh sorry, Nudge Plus basically is where you've got participation plus the nudge. Anyway, I'm going to um, ask Siddharth Gulati, if you're around to ask your question, please. Hi, uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. Um, I was just wondering if uh, nudges have also been used at BI in any kind of cybersecurity context. So in computer science, nudges have been used a lot to tackle phishing, to tackle uh, different cybersecurity issues, to ask people to have good cyber hygiene or uh, follow good cyber hygiene practices. But has this been implemented by BI team in particular? And have you seen the outcome of these interventions, if they were successful, if they were not successful? And if not successful, why? Sorry for such a long question. No, 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 that's fine. Um, and the honest answer is, I don't know, um, because... <laughs> Uh, I don't know everything that all my colleagues are doing. Um, so I can't off the top of my head. I've not done any work in this area. If you are interested, go and have a look at our Behavioural Insights team blog, which is just bi.team. Um, and if you search like cybersecurity, um, then you can, ah, oh, I can see one of my colleagues. So apparently we have done in France. Um, Chloe, I don't know if you can add anything. Sorry, yeah, so what we've done is we've basically um, done a trial where we try to get people to fall for uh, an ad, which is a fake ad, um, to, to basically see which people would be most vulnerable to phishing. And then when they're about to pay, we tell them, you know, this was not the real ad, these are the things you need to look at for to prevent them from doing it in the future. And it was effective to do that. Okay, thank you so much. I'll have a look at the blog. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm in a real dilemma now because we've got a chunky set, two questions about responsabilization and uh, agency, and then a sort of wrap up question about 10 years' time. Ah, uh, oh, I can't help it. Uh, Kerry Hughes, Kerry, can you do your question in like a sentence? And then John Preston, could you do a really short version of your huge question? And then Felicity will have 45 minutes to talk about responsabilization. Uh, Kerry. Thanks, Liz. Um, and my question was about the kinds of uh, models of agency that un in underpin policy areas. I was thinking about this in relation to welfare to work, where Sharon Wright has critiqued um, some of the those understandings of agency for being rather simplistic. Um, I was thinking in your kind of role in the BEIT team and for other people who are um, trying to influence the uh, Department for Work and Pensions, do you think there's scope, are there frameworks out there that offer a more nuanced understanding of agency, um, you know, that policymakers could be engaging with a bit more proactively? Thank you, Terry. And John Preston, I'm going to trust that you have this question really succinctly. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, yes, uh, I'm curious about uh, do you have any concerns that nudge theory and behavioural approaches can be used to push a personal responsibility narrative instead of broader systems level narratives? Um, and how do you kind of synthesise those different perspectives in your research and ensure that it's balanced? You okay. uh, honour my trust immensely. Felicity, you literally have like a minute and a half. Mary's answer is very 
easy because I actually don't know the term models of agency. So it might be that I sort of use a different term for it. Um, so given we've only got about four seconds left, I'm just going to park that one. Um, the question on personal responsibility versus systems, <clears throat> I suppose I would say this in its behavioral insights is about a more nuanced understanding of how people behave, of human behavior. Um, now, how it is used um, is sort of in the eye of the beholder to an extent. Um, but the behavioral insights team, as I said, we are commissioned to do pieces of work if we think that that work is sort of trying to fix a problem which is influenced by some other context, then um, uh, it would, um, you know, we would, we would always sort of, we would always mention that. Um, and I think, I guess a lot of it depends on sort of the, the political context of the day, I would say. So actually we are policymakers, we are, I mean, we're providing a policy advice, but it's up to ministers and elected politicians to sort of decide how that is used and how that is implemented. Oh, brilliant. Um, excellent, some really amazing stuff going on in the chat, but I'm going to hand back on time without asking the tenure time question, because we can do that in the follow-up. Fiona, I'm gonna hand back to you for a close. Thanks, Liz. So Felicity, that was a really great uh, lecture for us. Um, incredible insights, really interesting to hear about the new places in which uh, uh, the, this work can go. Thanks Liz for um, facilitating the discussion and also just been you know, really enjoying looking at all the questions and, and comments that, that have come through the chat function. So thanks for everyone to participate. I've got to admit to someone that leads a business school, but I'm sure anybody in these kind of jobs thinks if you want to influence behavior, you do have to spend a lot of time thinking, how do you make it easy for people to do so? And that is often my guiding principle. You know, if you're trying to change behavior or just get people on board with something, you've got to make it easy for people to do so. And I, I think I've seen on a number of occasions, the, you know, the authors of nudge theory talk about that in interviews. And it's, that's, that's what captures it for me in, in many ways. So really, really thoughtful uh, lecture. So um, just to finish, we have a fantastic series of, of lectures planned over the next uh, few weeks. But next week, we have our first vital to topics lecture of the calendar year. And this is when we're going to be joined by Stuart McClacken, who is co-founder and CEO of Antithesis Group and Professor Jonathan Pinsk, who's Professor of Strategy, Innovation and Entrepreneurship and Executive Director of the Manchester Institute of Innovation Research here at MBS, AMBS. And what we're going to be discussing or they'll be discussing is how companies can create a world that is decarbonized, which is biodiverse and is inclusive. So of course, huge topics of the day. Uh, and I very much hope that you will join us and the registration details I see are going to be added in the chat function if they haven't been already. So do please come and join us. And thank you very much for being with us. And thanks again to Felicity and Liz for a, a really great session. Thank you very much. And good evening. Thank you. Thank you.